Hello and welcome to this week's uh, Wednesday Winter Webinar Series from FarmBusinessConsulting.com. I'm pleased to have uh, our presenter is Bill Chapman from Alberta Agriculture and he is the uh, Crop Business Development Specialist and he's going to be going through uh, basically uh, helping us grow the grow malt and getting our best possible chance at uh, getting malt barley. So. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for attending, Bill, and uh, I'll hand over the presentation to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kent. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, you've got a nice, bright, sunny day like we have up here in beautiful downtown Barhead. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I'm uh, very optimistic. I'm always the guy that's uh, optimistic from the standpoint the glass is always half full. So uh, let's go through this. You can ask any questions at any point in time, and we'll get started. I'm all about sustainable barley update. When I say sustainable, I mean it has to be profitable, and that's why we're doing this. We're not doing it because we just like to grow barley. So I'm all about sustainability, and I'll tell you some of the key things I think that are critical and why. When you look at your whole system, I want you to take a step back and sort of look at your operation from uh, the 10,000-foot level and say, can I get more malt or can I get more malt accepted? Uh, the key thing here is can you adapt your farming system to make malt a sustainable production system? And I think there's a number of easy modifications to your management abilities to change those things. The first big one is I'm all about direct seeding and I'm about seeding early. Yes, seeding early. I would seed my malt barley first if I was a serious malt grower. And the reason I say that is because you want to start harvest early. You want to capture as much sunlight as you can. You want to capture the growing season. You want to capture the moisture opportunities. That's why we're direct seeding is to maximize the use of our inputs and also judicious use of inputs. I'm all about fertilizing to capacity and not over fertilizing but at the same time not under fertilizing and keeping everything in balance. Uh, it's critical to keep a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium balance with your fertility program. I'm all about in-crop scouting and awareness of the disease problems if you have any. Uh, scouting your fields prior to spraying for weeds, making sure you do have economic thresholds of those weeds. If you do have weeds coming early or late, knowing what's coming, keeping track of that in some type of a record keeping system. And also checking for insects, things like cutworms, uh, making sure you don't have any problems with wireworms because you'll see the wireworms before the cutworms, of course. And then I'm all about a harvest management system to try and get the crop off early. Uh, I like to straight cut everything, take it off a little tougher and aerate it down. I want to get that barley in the bin as fast as you can uh, to eliminate any problems with uh, some of the weather conditions we may see in late August, early September. And then I'm all about a sustainable identity preserve contract. I think that's the way to go. Uh, the malting companies in Alberta are offering you contracts. Uh, that's the key to get into their system. You've got to take the time to develop the rapport with the company. and then meet the customer needs and be profitable. Uh, it's critical that you understand where the malting company is going with their production, uh, what varieties they prefer, uh, what, uh, and we'll get into that in a few minutes, what key components uh, they're looking for when they actually screen your malt varieties and uh, take a look at the various quality attributes of them so that you can ensure you get malt more often. So these are the key malting characteristics that everyone has to meet. Uh, pure lot of an acceptable variety. It's critical to know what the company's after. Uh, most of them will tell you right up front. Uh, for instance, RAR uh, still has Kendall. They still have Metcalf. Uh, they are looking at other new varieties like Meredith. Uh, know that ahead of time. Uh, the competition out there, Canada Malt, they've got a similar list, but they've added varieties like Copeland and Bentley now to their list. Uh, again, you want a good germination on your seed, at least 95%. Uh, make sure you've done uh, testing of your seed fairly recently. Uh, and if you don't know it, you can still have time here to run a quick test, and you'd probably have to drive it in or courier it into the seed lab. But 
make sure you know what your germination is. When you harvest that crop, you want to make sure it's fully mature. They want it free from disease. They don't want problems uh, with disease. And we're seeing that now. Uh, barley is susceptible to stripe rust. It can cause some major problems on seed size and plumpness. Uh, they also want it free from frost damage. We've seen that in the past where frost damage will actually affect the germination and it affects the germination going into the, the vessels in the malt house. It's definitely going to affect the performance and that's why they're very cautious about frost damage. They don't want any weathering or staining. Uh, this definitely affects the kernel's ability to germinate and produce a decent uh, conversion rate. You're converting the starch to sugar and that's what gives you the malt characteristic to turn it into beer. Uh, they definitely want less than 5% peeled and broken kernels. Again, these peeled and broken kernels cause major problems with filtration and they lower their yield of actual malt in the malt plant. Uh, free from any heat damage. Uh, basically, we've had producers in the past with the uh, batch dryers try and dry their barley and because you're over drying half of it and under drying the other half and if you have your heat higher than you should uh, with a batch dryer, you don't want your temperature more than about 120, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to end up with uh, popcorn in the sample. Uh, what happens is that kernel will actually overheat and the starch will start to expand and that causes major problems because it kills the germination of that particular seed, which is what we're after in malt. Protein, we or moisture content, sorry, not protein. Moisture content, definitely 13.5% or lower. Uh, the problem here is uh, they don't want any problems with uh, germination or any other mycotoxin buildup in the actual stored sample. Uh, we ran into that in some wet falls in the past where your mycotoxins can actually build up in the stored grain. Even though the grain is cooler and it could be in that range between 8 and probably 14 or 15 degrees Celsius, you can still get some mycotoxin or mold growth in there. Uh, they want uh, they say not artificially dried, but it's key here. It's best to use a continuous flow grain dryer or aeration to keep your moisture content down. No desiccation. Uh, this desiccation actually use of glyphosate. Uh, even though glyphosate is registered by Monsanto for use on malt barley, the malt companies do not want any desiccants used on it. Uh, you can tell right away because this definitely affects the germination and the shoot growth, which definitely affects your conversion rate again in a malt house. A couple of other key points, free from primary insects, large oil bearing seeds, which can cause major problems in the malt house. Ergot, of course, is a real problem. No treated seed. And problems with smut and odor can also be major problems in the malt house as well with causing contamination and off flavors. Basically, we want plump at least 90% plus. Most cases now we're up in that 92 to 95% plump and with low to moderate protein. Um, most growers in Alberta can keep their protein somewhere in the range of, uh, there's not many in the 10-5 range, but there's lots in that range between 10-5 uh, and 11-5. They may creep up a little higher depending upon what the growing conditions are at the time of protein set, which is very late to the filling stage or sometime in mid to late August, depending upon our growing conditions. So those are the key characteristics they want that they've set out as key points to meet to make malt. And I think it's important that you understand that you can't just make 10 of the 13. You pretty well got to make them all. And that's what separates out the, the good quality product from the less quality. So if you're growing malt under contract in Alberta, uh, start with the manageable acreage you guys are, have already got that figured out to a large extent. Uh, I've always been a fan of putting it on a cleaner field, either a canola field, Roundup Ready or in bigger canola. Uh, this cleans up a number of weed problems and actually reduces uh, disease carryover from previous barley crops if you can seed it on a canola crop. Uh, I'm all about soil testing to manage our fertility and balance our nutrient levels. Again, my magic numbers for soil fertility for a 70 to an 80 bushel crop, uh, I recommend, and this is again just a recipe and it's based on your soil test, but uh, 70N, 30P, 20K, and 10S is kind of a, a rough estimate of where we're at in terms of fertility and then you can adjust that according to what your soil test is showing you. 
I'm a very big fan of making sure you're growing the right varieties and certified seed that is treated is my seed source of choice. Again, I say treated. A lot of you guys are seeding into cool soil conditions, uh, good moisture conditions. We don't want to create any uh, problems with seedling borne diseases with not treating the seed. Uh, to me, seed treatments like uh, making sure the uh, automatic transmission fluids in your car, your half-ton truck, and it's there for a reason. It uh, runs the transmission. It makes things work. And seed treatment is just one of those things that I've always uh, utilized in my sort of management toolbox. In terms of seeding rate, I'm all about managing that based on your moisture conditions. Uh, if you've never done a seeding rate calculator, you can go on our website, Alberta Agriculture, uh, we're open the web at agric.gov.ab.ca, and actually uh, calculate your seeding rate. Uh, in your area there, uh, in central Alberta, I'm all about somewhere in the range of 22 to 28 plants per square foot, depending upon your average rainfall. In the wetter areas, I like to seed heavier. We actually had some growers in that uh, Airdrie area last year push their seeding rate up to 30 to 32 plants per square foot with a larger amount of rainfall we had and actually turned out with very good results. But again, this is my magic fertilizer blend, uh, 70N, 30P, 25K, and 10A. 10S sulfur, basically, based on your yield target. And again, that's, I've always used one bushel of nitrogen, or one pound of nitrogen for every bushel of barley. Uh, some of the other agronomists in Alberta, like Ross McKenzie, are saying it should be one and a quarter to one and a half. I find if you push your end too high, uh, you're going to delay your maturity, and you're going to have some uneven spots in the field. So I'm all about trying to maximize the yield, and yet at the same time, be sustainable in what our inputs are. And you might want to increase or decrease that based on your own situation, your own practical experience. When I talk about uh, soil fertility, I always look at the fact that the soil test is the first 25% of the equation. The next 75% is A, you deciding what kind of target yield you're after, B, putting in a target, and C, fertilizing that field based on your knowledge and experience with that field. I can only make a suggestion to you as a starting point. It's then up to you to decide which way you want to go higher or lower and based on your target yield. Now in terms of varieties, let's just talk about those quickly. This is the 2012-2013 uh, Canadian Malting and Brewing Technical Center recommended two-row list. Uh, again, not big changes there. Metcalf is still number one. It's still one of the most popular varieties out there coming from Canada. Uh, Oakland has established itself now. It's actually got a definite marketplace out there uh, on the open market side, non-contract non dealing with the voluntary CWB now. Uh, the Chinese actually like Copeland, and it's stable demand. Newdale is a new one. Uh, it's limited demand. Basically, Newdale's mainly Canada malt. Uh, RAR really hasn't picked up on it. They pref RAR actually prefers Metcalf. Uh, Kendall and now CDC Meredith. And of course, Kendall's been part of the Sapporo program for a number of years with RAR. Uh, an interesting change there is uh, Prairie Malt, which also ships to Sapporo, is actually, again, contracting a small amount of CDC Polar Star. And that's been fairly stable. Some of the new varieties that recently got research, uh, registered and under commercial testing, uh, Bentley's now moved on to Canada Malt's list. But some of the other new varieties that uh, are not yet being grown commercially are varieties like Major, Merritt, Norman, Cerveza, and CDC Reserve. Uh, Major's a new one coming out of Dr. Bill Lake's program in Brandon, Manitoba. Merritt, of course, Merritt 57 is an Anheuser-Busch variety under contract. Uh, Norman is a new one coming out of uh, Bill Lake's program as well. Uh, both of them very good yielders, Norman and Major. Uh, Cervasus, a new interesting one. This one's actually designed for the uh, craft beer market and uh, also looking at some potential markets in Central America. And of course, CDC Reserve comes out of the Saskatoon program. And again, it's uh, slowly gaining some acres, but I think Meredith will actually take over because of the higher yields. Six row market. I really don't want to spend a lot of time here. Uh, it was announced that the uh, 
American Brewing Association meeting here that six rows will probably be discontinued in the next two years uh, when the largest beer company comes out and makes that statement, Anheuser-Busch, you can pretty well be assured the six row mark is, is died. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but again, it's strictly contract basis and uh, limited market opportunities on the six row side. Now, Bill, I got a question here from my guy. Yep. Um, he was just wondering with uh, the wheat board now uh, being an open market uh, come August 1st, if um, back a few slides uh, where you had your, your specs for getting malt barley, if uh, you think that, you know, things are going to widen out like it was, uh, you know, 10 and a half to 13 for protein, if now a 13 to 14 may be available for certain sales at a discounted rate or different germination, stuff like that. Uh, based on the comments from uh, uh, Joe Fung, Joe is a retired uh, malt person with super time out of the China. Uh, in the past, they've actually bought what they call fair average quality out of Australia. And I thought we might have some competition opportunities there with the new board, and specifically maybe one or two grain companies would go after that, what we called an Alberta street malt program. But based on his comments here a few weeks ago at the Western Barley Growers meeting, uh, they still want quality. Uh, they're still willing to pay for it. So I think we'll have to wait and see to see if those actual ranges occur. Uh, my gut instinct after hearing what Joe said and talking to him in the hallway is that uh, no, they still want quality. Uh, there might be some small markets for that fair average quality. But uh, I think our main focus still should stay on the quality side. To say that it's going to move one way or the other, I thought it might move into that street malt or fair average quality. But based on those comments and what I hear from some of the other uh, malt companies at the recent variety registration meetings in Banff, I don't think we can assume it's going to widen out. I think we're, we're going to have to wait and see maybe a year or two before that changes. Right. OK. I'll uh, interrupt when there's more questions coming yep. through. Okay. okay, sounds good. Yep. We'll go back to where we were. Uh, in Canada, domestic use is right around that million tons. That's kind of the long-term five-year average. Uh, at least three, well, somewhere between 366 and 400,000 tons are used by our domestic uh, companies in Canada. So you can see it's dominated. Uh, well over 92% two row and about uh, eight to ten percent six row, and again, this is probably going to drop down even more. As I mentioned, uh, when uh, Malting and Brewers Association came out and say, said that uh, it's going to drop off significantly uh, to hardly any sales in the next two years, the problem with the six rows is they're actually lower yielding, so you get uh, less malt out of a ton of barley, and then uh, because of the lower percentage of starch on a six row, uh, you get less conversion. And so in the end, it's less bottles of beer per ton. So that's why they've made that uh, move to stay more focused on the two row side of things. In terms of the export side, again, in the past, six row was up as high as 15%. But again, that whole extract thing and profitability, uh, malt production around the world, is a very tight, controlled market, and everyone's trying to maximize their profits. Uh, we have a little bit of excess capacity out there that's being underutilized. Again, it's spread around in different countries. Bottom line is it's a tight market, not a lot of expansion right now. Most of the expansion is happening into China, where the new demand is coming, and India. Again, the growing populations, as they gain a taste for beer, that's where we're seeing some market growth. But again, uh, in some cases, that beer quality isn't what you guys are used to consuming here in Canada. Uh, no lie, uh, different people have told me, and I've never seen this, but in some of the southern Asia countries, you can actually buy uh, beer in bulk on the corner, and you basically bring your own container or pail and cup and, uh, yeah, sit in the corner and drink this sort of corner-style beer. Uh, in Japan, it's the lower tax beer. It's the second and third categories. In China, I'm not sure exactly what it's called there, but yeah, you can buy the lower quality beer on the street corner. And again, with a lot of the uh, 
workers in those countries gaining economic advantage in the rising middle class in China and India. Uh, they're after the premium grade, so they're seeing small growth there, whereas the average worker is just interested in buying the street quality beer. So it's going to be interesting to see how it affects the overall market. In Alberta, this is an old slide. I apologize for the oldness of it, but uh, Metcalf still number one. It's well over 50% of the seeded acres. Copeland has come up. It's close to 20% now. Kendall's dropped down to less than about 10. Of course, Herring doesn't exist. Harrington doesn't exist anymore, and you're seeing small acres of things like Newdale and Bentley moving in. So, uh, bottom line is the prairies are roughly similar. Uh, Saskatchewan might have a little more uh, Copeland and Metcalf. But uh, yeah, and Manitoba might have a few more acres of Newdale, but Newdale really hasn't taken off yet. I'm not even going to talk about the six rows. Now, I apologize for this very busy slide. Uh, you're going to go cross-eyed. And the reason I left it in is because the 2011 cost of production guide is on our website. And all I wanted to do is get you to focus on the fourth category over malt barley, select two row. And this is what we've put in there as an estimated cost of production with a target yield of 75 bushels per acre. I expected market price in 2010 was 401. Um, you guys are well aware of what the maltsters are offering you this year. It's somewhere between five and six dollars, depending upon which month you signed a contract in and and what you negotiated on your contract. But what I just wanted to show you in here is they're showing similar numbers here. You can actually go on our website and find this new crop production under agri-profits, uh, cost in production, and you can actually go in by soil zone. So it's black, gray wooded, brown, and dark brown. You can actually put in your own numbers here, depending upon what your fertility is, what you estimate your chemical costs at, uh, things like chemical costs. You can adjust that according to what your present practices are. But a lot of these other costs from 2010, 2011 are fairly fixed. This is an average calculated cost across your whole farm. And what this does, it actually shows you an estimate of what your actual costs are per acre so that when you do get a price quote, you can actually figure out what your return or your contribution margin is. I think it's important to really know what your uh, break-even yield is. This is critical to know what uh, your break-even is so that you understand whether you're making or losing money. Of course, Mother Nature usually decides that for us, but we know that uh, what what our long-term averages are. And this gives us a bit of a, a negotiating position when we do look at costs, if we can afford to produce for that or not. And again, it's just a yardstick. You can use that. Uh, in some cases, uh, if you have this figured out ahead of time, some of my banker friends uh, do get surprises once in a while, but if you have to sit down with your banker this spring and go through your cost of production, uh, you can actually figure it out ahead of time using the numbers from 2011 on, again, the website agric.gov.ab.ca. And you can go in there and get the 2011, is the most recent one because I just checked uh, yesterday. The 2012 one should be up in the next two weeks. So I'm hoping to see that up shortly. Yeah, and you're pretty much preaching to the choir because that's yeah. that's a standard in my group and that's who you're present presenting to today is we've already got our cost of production the only thing we're out is obviously chemical for this year yeah. so um, and, I and, and just to read your nice. yeah and just to reiterate what you said is um, you know by penciling in um, a fair market price for uh, malt uh, versus other crops as far as cereals go um, I was really quite bullish on on malt um, because I really see there being higher feed sales as well. So, um, yep. you know, when we're comparing uh, guys who get malt 80% of the time compared to um, a number two red spring wheat only 50% of the time, um, when we figured in our cost of production, it was well worth putting that extra flexible quarter into malt barley instead of a uh, uh, wheat variety. So, so and the other thing is, is I have again, it's a matter of field scouting. Uh, I would be putting in a fungicide here uh, in my chemical treatment, and I think that's where 
uh, you see an increased cost here of 35.50 per acre. That's more than what wild oats are. I think if you go to the actual uh, instructions here, that little asterisk on the malt barley and field peas, and in some cases spring wheat includes a fungicide application as well. And I would be budgeting that in, uh, even though you don't normally use uh, fungicides in your area all the time. Uh, if we do have a wetter spring based on the strike rust problems we've seen in the past uh, on wheat and barley, I think it's critical to budget that in as well. Now, some of the key production agronomic aspects that I'm into, I talked about seeding rate earlier. In your area, it's probably between 22 and 28 plants per square foot. Again, this is rainfall based. Uh, I would tend to be on the higher side based on the old in intensive crop management or maximum economic yield research on agronomy that came out of Europe here 20, 30 years ago. You get more kernels per head on the main stem than you do on tillers. The other problem with tillers is you run into problems with delays in harvest. Uh, that's where all that uh, green seed comes from or immature shrunken kernels. That all comes off the tiller. So I'm all about trying to maximize my plant stand uh, early on and maintain a competitive plant stand. So that's why I've been focused on the higher rates. Seed treatment, again, dual purpose. I'm saying use the products that will control fusarium head blight and take all. I think it's critical, again, to control any seedling-borne diseases. We don't want anything affecting the, the production system, especially once we get that crop established. Again, seed early. Once that soil temperature gets above 4 to 6 degrees Celsius, you can go in there. Again, I'm still pre-seed burnoff. Make sure you control some of the problem weeds, uh, especially if you have any problems with uh, quackgrass, which doesn't seem to be a problem anymore with the use of pre-harvest and wheat, or again, uh, the Roundup Ready Tolerant Canolas. Again, I like to seed in the moisture, seed early in spring to try and harvest early in August to make sure you get that malt off. Uh, other suggestions on the agronomy side. I'm all about scouting fields regularly. I look at economic thresholds for insects and weeds. Again, it's all about using recommended pesticides if you exceed those thresholds. I'm all about spraying wild oat products early, trying to get in in that two to four leaf stage for most of your wild oat products. Uh, if you are using uh, some of the later application combinations, uh, make sure you follow their label, label recommendations as well. I know some guys on their tank mix will delay till the three to four leaf stage, maybe into five or an early tiller, uh, depending upon if you have some of those problem broadleafs out there that don't germinate very early. Uh, yeah, try and get your, your field sprayed early. And again, watch those disease levels. Uh, if we do have wetter conditions this spring, we can see buildup of uh, things like scald and net blotch early. Uh, scald is more of a yield robber than what net blotch is, but again, uh, both are a consideration. And again, I can mention stripe rust is a real problem. We saw an increase in the uh, acres of it this past year, and it definitely reduced our yields. In terms of managing the crop, I'm all about straight cutting. Uh, if you do like to swat, though, wait till 30% kernel moisture co content. 30% uh, is when you can actually uh, take your thumbnail and leave an imprint of your fingernail uh, on the actual kernel. Uh, it's easier to see in wheat, but you can do the same thing on malt barley. Uh, if you can actually indent that kernel, you're somewhere between 25 and 30 percent moisture content. I'm all about harvesting quality and separate binning. If you have any problems in that field when you're straight cutting it, uh, cut around it. I know it's a hassle to go back, but uh, I hate to see it if you lose a 5 or 10,000 bushel bin because you ended up throwing some green stuff in with uh, the better quality stuff or the quality just wasn't there. If you have any uh, flooded areas or any problem areas that are uh, shrunken or shriveled kernels or lower plump, uh, that'll definitely impact your overall crop quality. And I'm all about separate binning that or trying to you know, save that load and sell it to the feedlot instead. Make sure you check your combine settings to reduce peeling. Uh, if you're daily temperatures change a lot or you see your moisture conditions changing a lot, just keep double checking. Uh, the last thing we want to do is have any peel problems. Again, especially if you've changed the uh, rub bars, uh, if they're brand new, 
uh, pick a different crop other than your malt barley to uh, take the rough, the sharp edge off them. Uh, we haven't had problems with this, but I have seen the odd time where a, a semi load does get rejected because of peeling. And again, grain samples are critical. In this case, most of your stuff is already contracted, but it's always good to have grain samples. And I'm all about uh, having extra grain, making sure you've got at least one 20 or five gal 20 liter pail or five gallon pail for every bin. Now I'm saying let's get two. Uh, if you want, you can actually send your samples in ahead of time for grading. It uh, makes your marketing life a lot easier. Again, it's critical to have good samples. In terms of integrated disease management in the long term, I'm all about a cereal broadleaf crop rotation. Uh, we see problems with ergot right now. I'll, the only way to break that ergot cycle is to get uh, two years of broadleaf in there and start mowing some of the field margins. And hopefully we don't have a growing year like we had last year where we saw that cold, wet weather really increase the amount of ergot spores out there and then come in with uh, ergot problems. Again, treat your seed with recommended seed treatment. Follow the label. Again, balance crop nutrition to support those target yields. I think it's critical that we put the groceries on the crop. Uh, you all know that if you want to drive to town, you need a full tank of gas. Well, you can't try and get there on half a tank. So, And the other thing is keep it in balance. And again, I'm, I'm a real fan of soil testing. If you do have a micronutrient deficiency, I want to know that it is a deficiency. And I definitely prefer the labs from Western Canada. I know some companies are using labs from the U.S. or Eastern Canada. I'm a fan of the Western Canadian labs. I've got the most experience with them and more trusting, I guess, of their numbers. Field scouting to monitor disease levels. I'm all about checking your fields every 7 to 10 days. Uh, get out there, walk around, see what you find. Uh, keep field records for your own case. Uh, keep track of what you sprayed on what field, and then you can go back in there uh, seven to ten days or two weeks after it was sprayed and make sure you've got weed control uh, that's acceptable to your your liking and also whether or not you've got any problem weed starting to show up. I think this is one where we're going to have to do some more work on. And it's not in the actual slides here, but we're starting to see some buildup of herbicide resistance. And the new trend coming out of the chemical companies is uh, combinations, especially on the broadleaf side, using group twos and group fours in combination rather than just one or the other. So it's something to monitor. And if you start to see something build up, uh, make notes on it and then do some follow-up checks. Again, check leaf disease levels early uh, because you most of your benefit comes from spraying that uh, leaf or that fungicide for leaf disease at the emergence of the flag leaf. Uh, and again here, in some of the new work coming out of Kelly Turkington in Lacombe, uh, in the past, we've seen some interesting reduction by tank mixing tilt with our wild oat herbicide at the three to five leaf stage. Any of the new work that Kelly's showing, that really is an economic uh, save your fungicide dollar and focus it on the uh, flag leaf emergence. He's getting a lot better results. And in some three-year studies that he's done, he's getting anywhere from 18 to 20 percent yield increase with the fungicide application in barley. So I think it's critical to keep that in. I apologize, this is a, a leaf of wheat, but it's the best stripe rust picture I've got. Uh, this is what stripe rust looks like on AC Vista wheat uh, taken at the research station in Lacombe. Uh, we saw increased levels of this right throughout Alberta this past year. Uh, this is the problem that's occurring. There is no genetic resistance in most of the commercial varieties we have. And uh, usually it comes in late in July. It will overwinter on winter wheat. It will blow in from southern Alberta winter wheat acres. It also blows in from the Pacific Northwest in Washington, Oregon, uh, which moves up from other states like California. And it's becoming a very virulent disease out there. So keep watching your fields for this one. In terms of harvest management, again, I like to straight cut at between 16 and 18 percent moisture, then aerate it down. If you do want to swath, you can swath it between 25 and 30 percent moisture. Again, uh, seed early, aerate it down, and keep your plenum temperatures on your dryer down in that 40 degrees Celsius range. Again, we don't want to be making popcorn out of any of the grain that we grow. That's our chance to maximize our return. If you do have some hot days at harvest, I'm all about aeration. 
On the aeration side, though, uh, this is something really interesting. There's some new studies coming out of the University of Manitoba to show that the best time to get any kind of results with aeration and reduce your power consumption is they're suggesting that you just turn the fans on at nighttime, which is different than what I've always used. I was always under the impression you wanted to keep your fans on 24-7 to try and manage your moisture levels, but the new studies are showing that uh, the best results are just aerating during the evening hours and nighttime hours. So we'll have to follow that one. Maximizing quality, we want to key in there. It, basically, you get paid for what you grow. Try and eliminate any problems with frost, weathering, sprouting, staining. That's why we want to seed that crop early. Again, we want to stay away from peeled and broken kernels. Check your cylinder speeds, especially if it gets hot and dry during the day. You might have to slow that cylinder speed down just a little bit. And again, we want that final product somewhere around 13, 5% moisture. Protein content somewhere, you know, our average is probably going to be 11.5 to 12.5, depending upon the growing conditions. But again, to get maximum quality on that malt contract, you've got to have high germ and high kernel plumpness in that 90, probably 92% range on average, maybe 95. And you guys are actually being... I've uh, been able to accomplish that in the last few years, especially last year, our quality went back up again. So it's nice to see that we're not the low end on the barley quality side when you're trying to sell that product in the world. Just a question so that will fit in here. Um, the question is, uh, do you have a recommendation on uh, after drying how full you should fill the bin if there's a certain percentage you should leave open for sweating? I've always left that, you know, just a little bit at the top for sweating, and I'm always about leaving the, the vent open and double checking it. Uh, usually, you've got to wait that two to three weeks for it to go through the sweat. Uh, I've never believed in filling bins uh, right up to the rim. I think it's critical that you leave a little bit air space there. And uh, again, uh, <clears throat> I. I want, I want to do some checking with a number of farmers here to see if they've tried this idea of just turning the fans on at night uh, for cooling. Um, basically, the old uh, work that was done with the egg engineers and fan sizing and speed was always leave the fans on 24-7 to let the drying front move through the grain bin. Again, I, uh, I can't say if I'm one way or the other, I'd probably... If push comes to shove, I'd probably hesitate to just turn them on at night. And uh, based on all the work I've done with other farmers and watching aeration and, and watching our moisture levels was leaving the bin fans on and you know letting that moisture line move up the bin as, uh, as the fans are on. If you're just using natural system with no... No fans, yes, you want to make sure you leave some airspace there and leave the vents open. And yeah, the, basically what happens is the cool air moves down the sides of the bin and the warm, moist air moves up the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, no lie, uh, I actually have had farmers, and this may sound a little off the wall, but guys took a, a 6 to 8 inch plastic pipe uh, attached a screen around the outside of it, drilled holes in the in the pipe and actually used it like a stove pipe down the middle of the bin just to enhance the natural movement of air hmm. uh, through the grain bin to eliminate any moisture buildup on that cap in the middle of the bin. So again, I never saw it. This was just talking to a couple of growers in the Stony Plain area and they were convinced it was the answer. They weren't going to buy aeration fans, but they put these stove pipes in all their bins and just hung them down when they filled the bin. So. <laughs> so in terms of record keeping, uh, down the road, uh, record keeping and traceability for food safety uh, is going to be something, if you're not doing it now, if you are a RAR customer, you know what the record keeping book is all about. Uh, this will be a standard normal procedure in the future. So uh, again, a few records at the time of application is critical in terms of future market opportunities. Uh, that was one of the things that some of the large international grain companies have asked me at some of these different conferences I've been at is if, you know, if they don't have a traceability program now, is it possible? And I think in the next few years you're going to see that uh, as being very commonplace in the system. Any other questions? 
I have two more. So are you? Okay. You're finished then, or? Yep, that's it. Okay. I, I'm I'm all about short and sweet. So. No, that's good. Um, just the uh, last couple of questions, and again, for those of you that uh, maybe the first or second time and you forgot, um, underneath in the chat box, you can type a question in there and I can see it, or you can always just text it to me, and that seems to be how I get most of my uh, questions here, so that's why I'm just paraphrasing uh, some of these questions, too. Um, I guess uh, I'll go to the first one that was posed here. Um, are you finding with uh, any hard red spring wheat, say like Imagine and Abound, uh, that are clear field, is there any Odyssey residue or anything that a person should be aware of, um, you know, planting nope, malt nope. after you as grow long clear as, field? As, as long as you're following the recommended rates at the recommended time with the proper pre-harvest interval, uh, that's the one thing for that product to get registered. It has to meet the standard. So as long as you're following the label, Shouldn't be a problem. Okay. And uh, this has to do with uh, the stripe rust. Um, what can a person do to prevent stripe rust? Or how do you, um, if you have it, how do you, or what do you do? Well, basically you want to be scouting your field looking for it. Uh, there's going to be some information on Rope in the Web. The seed cleaning plants are getting a new poster on it. Our, our Pest protection people with Alberta Ag have uh, have a new extension effort to get awareness out there. You can also Google it, of course, or uh, talk to any of your agronomists or pathologists out there. Uh, the problem with striped rust is it's a very virulent disease. It's airborne spores that will move in on the southern winds that are coming up from the south. So you really can't prevent it that way. The biggest thing is if you have it, and you start to see a buildup of it, you have to be prepared to spray. And the key here is is you have about a four to a eight day window to try and get those key cereal acres sprayed. So if you've got a large acreage, you're in a bit of a bind there. Uh, the key is to actually have the fungicide in place. So if you start monitoring your fields uh, sometime in mid-July, early July, you'll see if you're starting to see any buildup the disease does have multiple generations in the field. It takes about, uh, depending upon growing conditions, moisture, etc. if it's hot and wet, uh, but not too hot. If it gets too hot and dry, it'll actually reduce the impact, and we've seen that in previous years, but we're talking plus 30 degrees Celsius and very dry, which we really don't want for crop conditions. But we will see a reduction in those conditions if it gets too hot and dry. But we're seeing problems right through Alberta, and if it stays in that 20 to 25 degree range through August, uh, and it is moist out there, and we do see moist conditions in the crop, uh, make sure you, you know, seriously consider spraying a percentage of your crop that you will want to protect, and be prepared to get out there uh, and check those crops, you know, early. Early, you want to get out there before flag leaf hits, so you know you've got to be checked. Depending upon when you seed the crop, you could be checking as early as the second, third week of July and starting spraying right away then to, in other cases, in more northerly areas, it could be a week later. So, you know, it's going to be scouting in late June, early July to see if we actually have it. And you can see it right away on your work boots. You'll see it in the, the rust will actually stick to your work boots and give you that rusty, sort of dusty color. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it's a matter of protecting. You want to protect that flag leaf because that's where your plumpness and final yield comes from. So it's the top two leaves that we're trying to protect. Okay, and then another disease question. Um, how do you see uh, ergot being a problem in barley? Um, noticing that there's quite a bit in the Camros area in this last year. And I guess yep. while you're answering that, maybe because I know it's a huge thing uh, about ergot and wheat, um, just... I guess more guys are looking at, is this going to be a continuing problem or is it kind of a one-off year and what contributes well, to ergot? Let's, let's, let's get rid of some of the rumors. Number one, uh, hard red spring wheat does get a little more of it and there is no difference between varieties or uh, we've had some, some seed people saying that there's a difference between their variety and the next one. That's not true. <laughs> and there's no difference between bearded and uh, non-bearded wheat. Uh, it's all based on your spore load in your area. If there's been a lot of uh, 
grass in your area, like ditches, marginal areas. Uh, that's the spore load problem. And it's the weather conditions the last two or three years that have really contributed to the buildup of the ergot bodies that are laying on the soil surface. Uh, there's no, there, there doesn't seem to be a difference between uh, early, uh, early seeding seems to be better. Uh, and this past year with the cool, wet conditions, a lot of the wheat was flowering all at the same time. And uh, yeah, the hard red seems to be a little later in flowering, a little longer in flowering, and that's the, with the wet conditions, that's what contributed to the problem of ergot we saw right across Alberta. Uh, I guess the three, con three practices you can use to try and reduce it, number one is, again, seeding earlier helps. Uh, number two, trying to break that cereal rotation, so growing two years of broadleaf crop. I know that's not the best agronomic recommendation, but I guess a canola pea is a better option than a canola canola or a pea pea crop. Uh, the other thing is is mowing your roadside ditches, trying to get the counties out there in your area to try and get some mowing done earlier. Uh, it's the quack grass and the brome grass in the ditches and margin areas around the field that is a big contributing factor. That's where all the ergot bodies are. Uh, and yeah, uh, s some farmers in the past have tried to come back in and do tillage to bury those ergot bodies. Again, you're only burying a small portion of it in your actual field. And again, it's a windborne disease similar to stripe rust. And the other problem is, is we go through multiple generations of it in the field if it is higher levels. And this past year, we actually had the, the, the stage where we actually saw the ergot affect the wheat early and then once the ergot starts to affect the wheat it'll actually kind of develop a brown sugary type ooze coming out of that developing embryo and seed then the insects little flies little other sucking insects will start to be attracted to that ooze and then they'll just increase the ooze spread along the head as they move up and down the head uh, gathering ooze and again it's a short period of time it's about uh, four to six days in the crop when you see that ooze, but if you've ever seen it before, it's quite uh, different. It's very sticky, and again, the insects are all attracted to it, and they just spread it through the whole head. So, Okay, and I guess that's pretty much the same um, with, uh, with barley, or is barley not as susceptible well, barley, to it? Barley is as susceptible as wheat, but barley seems to get it uh, to a lesser level depending upon conditions and when it was seeded and when it was flowering. So it's a bit of a crapshoot. It, it all depends on what the weather does up until flowering stage. So once we see head emergence, because all your cereals are self-pollinated, most of the pollination happens inside the actual kernel, and it's only under that either dry conditions or cool and wet conditions that we see that delay in flowering that causes the problem. And again, there's been... Uh, talk of trying to get breeding efforts to try and change it. It's a very complicated system in the plant, and uh, it, the cost of trying to change our breeding to actually make or create varieties that have some resistance to it would be very, very expensive and time-consuming. We've been talking about this for as long as I've been around the cereal industry, which is close to 30 years, and there's really no, no perfect answer. It's a combination of conditions that uh, contribute to the disease buildup. So I think we'll probably have some ergot around for the next couple of years. And then once the weather gets hotter and drier and we see a weather pattern change, it may change again. Right. Okay, well that's it for questions. And uh, okay. uh, on behalf of my uh, clients and uh, myself, I really uh, thank you for your time and giving us an hour of your time, Bill, because I know your your 30 years of experience and your your information that a person cannot find anywhere else. So um, I really appreciate. Well, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it, and I know like you covered um, a ton of questions of that I'm always being asked, and I don't have the expertise like you do. So I can tell you when to sell your barley, but <laughs> not how to grow it. So. So this is great information, and I really appreciate it. So thanks again for well, your time. We, the other thing we can do is this actually worked better than I thought it would. I, I didn't. I've never done a webinar before. Yeah. So if you want to do one closer to the crop scouting season, uh, 
we can possibly do something like that or yeah other maybe something like on uh, on stripe rust or something like that cuz yeah. i mean Definitely. most of my guys are growing like both wheat and barley so i mean it can be yeah, a short no. little presentation as to like yeah. the beauty of this is um you know there's uh there was eight people on online watching but within 24 hours pretty much all my guys watch it cuz i record it and it's uh, loaded up to my website so um you know, and it, yeah, it works for, I mean, web. I've been a big proponent of webinars for years, so I can, in any given week, I can be on uh, six to eight, and I know exactly what you're talking about, about the aeration fan uh, one, because I was on that webinar, and that really surprised me as well, because that was always conventional f wisdom, was uh, leave it on all the time, right, so. Well, and I think, I guess I'm still a fan of leaving it all, all the time, because you know what I remember from ag engineering back some thirty some years ago when I was in university is you know that drying front moves very slowly through the grain bin and i I'm sorry physics hasn't changed in thirty years it still moves very slowly through the grain bin so mm -hmm. I'm quite surprised at that so we'll yeah. see it'll uh it'll be interesting to see what comes out on that one yeah for sure well again thanks again uh, for your time bill yeah, no and uh, we'll definitely take you up on your uh, on your <laughs> uh, recommendation of doing something on stripe rust when it becomes time so yeah. um, you Sounds know some, sometime through the summer we'll pick a pick a day it doesn't have to be a Wednesday or it doesn't have to be early or later in the afternoon it can be whenever so yeah no sounds good Ken Okay, thanks a lot, and thanks for everybody attending. Like I said, uh, next yeah. week is going to be a presentation by Red Chandro, Chandro Consulting Services, talking about succession planning and why you should use a professional succession planner instead of an accountant or a lawyer to help you in uh, those treacherous waters. So hopefully you guys can join again, uh, and as well, this presentation will be available within a few hours online, and you can watch it at your convenience. So thanks, everybody, for attending.